Thank you, members. We now are moving on to questions to the Minister for Communities. Uh, can I advise the House that question number 12 has been withdrawn? I call Mr. Paul Frew. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, question number one, Minister. Thank you. Um, I suppose just an outcome on the report on the consultation was published on the departmental website in November 2020. There was overwhelming support for the reform of the gambling legislation, and I am on record as saying that the legislation reform is long overdue, given the scale of the reform that is needed. I am keen to bring forward proposals for some regulatory change um, in this mandate and have advised for the Committee for Communities of my intention to do so in the schedule of legislation. As soon as I am in a position to do so, I will make an announcement on the way forward um, as quickly as possible. Mr. Fruit. Thank you, Minister, for your answer uh, and your commitment to bring in legislation in this term. I really appreciate it. Uh, Article 168 of the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Northern Ireland Order 1985 prohibits promotional non skill prize draws linked to a product here. Would any legislation take into consideration the fact that UK wide companies that undertake promotional prize competitions that are linked to the purchase of a product disadvantage, disadvantages Northern Ireland consumers by the fact that they are not involved? Yes, well, those issues were picked up on in terms of the consultation and engagement that has been ongoing, and part of that um, will be coming forward in changes um, in the time ahead. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's um, uh, point here. I uh, would like to give the Minister an opportunity to join with me and welcome our, uh, wish our football team the very best of uh, luck tonight as they face Ukraine and try and defend a 2 0 lead and hopefully do even better. But um, would the Minister's proposals uh, perhaps to ban gambling practices? Uh, that are most likely to cause harm be something that she's considering. So, uh, such things like free bets, free spins, VIP schemes, and re reverse withdrawal um, functions? Yes, well, all of those options are being looked at, and obviously uh, we're actively considered in terms of the impact that it has. I'm also obviously working in terms of health to look at the health implications and issues around. Um, addiction in terms of gambling services as well. So that is being considered, and I think there was a recognition when the consultation went out um, that reform is definitely needed in these areas. And of course, I wish the team well tonight, and hopefully they'll come home with a victory. Ms. Karen Mullen. Minister, will you support the establishment of a gambling, an independent gambling regulator? Yes, I would indeed um, support the establishment. Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Could the Minister outline what steps or actions, if any, government here or even government elsewhere could take to ensure tighter regulation of online betting sites? I think it's an issue that's being looked at. Obviously, it's a growing issue just by its very nature in terms of uh, social media and in terms of online gambling opportunities um, that are presented to people. So, of course, we're proactively looking at ways that we can engage. Obviously, we're discussing this in terms of health as well and the impact that it has at the other end. And obviously, any legislation that we want to bring forward, we want to look at prevention. Um, before it gets to that critical point then where people need um, assistance and need in terms of the addiction that they have. So we are in regular engagement in terms of looking at those options and we will lay those out in the time ahead that will take into consideration, um, I suppose, the increase in issue of online gambling. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Question number two. Thank you for your question. And just um, as I have outlined in previous statements by my department, we have no plans in place to mark the centenary. A three million pound fund, however, to mark the centenary has been set up by the British government, and this includes one million pounds of funding to be distributed through the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, with, with the NIO um, is in the lead. That aside, in line with the statutory remit of PRONI, they will facilitate access to archival records um, it occurs for, which are relevant to the centenary by individuals, organisations and the media. Prony will also launch an A-level educational resource entitled 1900 to 1925 
Crisis, War and Revolution in May 2021, which comprises a range of archival material covering the period, including sources relating to the establishment um, of Northern Ireland State and opening the Northern Ireland Parliament. Plans have been in place for some time now across a number of our arm's length bodies and other funded organisations to mark the centenary, and I have asked my officials to write to you separately, just providing you with an update of their plans. Mr. Buckley. Well, Deputy Speaker, sadly, the Minister's answer today confirms verbally what indeed the Minister confirmed to Mr. Alistair in written format that, in a sense, the Department of Communities will not fund the centenary celebrations in Northern Ireland. Many people in Northern Ireland will rightly view your callous snub of the centenary uh, as a recurrent and running theme within Sinn Féin, first centenary stone, and now a department which has so much responsibility, no funding coming forward. So can I ask the Minister, when will the Department of Communities, plural, step up and respect the cultural aspirations of a significant community within Northern Ireland? Well, firstly, there's nothing callous in my approach, and I have to say that right now to the member, and I think it's unfortunate that he's trying to use those remarks in terms of this question. The reality is, is that I think anything around the marking of the centenary, when you look at the decade of centenaries, and I was involved extensively in this in Belfast City Council as my time as a councillor, where we did manage to already agree a programme that looked at all of these events in the context of one event has an impact on another. So whether that was the formation of the Northern State or whether you looked at that in terms of partition and looking at that from the different perspectives. And I think as we approach all of these issues, and they are sensitive issues, for some it's a celebration and for others it's not. It's an event which has negative connotations. And I think that we need to be responsible and sensitive in terms of how we address all of these issues. What I would prefer to see is that we sit down collectively as an executive. It's not just the responsibility for me as Communities Minister. We need to approach these sensibly. Uh, we need to look at all of the events in their widest context and how one event has an impact on another and how then we can communicate that with the public. Because we are living in a contested society. We are seeing issues emerge on our interfaces um, and things rupture. And I think that anything that we do has to be planned, it has to be considered in terms of looking at all of those issues. My experience of how that worked well before, as I said, was within Belfast City Council, where all of the political parties, or most who are represented in this chamber, sat down in a coordinated and structured way to plan out events. Um, now, that hasn't happened. Um, the NIO, of course, are running forward with events. Some of my arm's length bodies in those departments, such as Prony, as I said, are doing events. But if we're serious in terms of looking back at the past, learning than that, in terms of building forward for the young people that we've seen on the streets of Belfast and beyond over the last week, then we need to be mature about it rather than saying that we're acting callously. We need to look at all of these issues in the round in terms of how it reflects right across the community. And of course, the centenary is held dearly by some people Minister. in our society, but so too is the issue of partition Minister. and the ramifications, and we need to look at all of that in the round. There are several other members listed. I would ask members to be direct in their questions and the Minister to be direct in their answers, otherwise this may well take up the entirety of question time. Um, Mr Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last count and following on from the Minister's previous uh, answer. Would she agree that there are many people here in the North who, who find nothing at all to celebrate about partition and what followed on from it, uh, and that it's important that any uh, centenary events reflect the different narratives of the past here. I think we have a, a learned and complex history, um, and we do have a responsibility to lead. We obviously are coming from a contested and divided society. We're trying to build reconciliation. We're trying to give hope to the future for our young people. And we need to approach all of these historic events, which can cause, I suppose, issues to rupture again. Uh, we need to do that sensitively, we need to do it collectively, and we need to look at the issues and how they knit into one another um, and how they have an impact on communities as a whole. I am willing to engage in a process like that, and I would ask that others do the same. Mr Tim Allister. The title that the Minister holds in this House is Minister for Communities. 
She knows that the unionist community, for, for it, the centenary of Northern Ireland is very, very important. And yet, consciously and deliberately, she presides over a department in which she did not seek one penny for its budget, does not have money to spend for the community groups within that unionist community who want Question. to celebrate the centenary or to uh, organisations that want to celebrate it. Order. When is the Order. I appreciate the depth of feeling that there is around these issues. And uh, Mr Buckley had tabled his question, and I give him some leeway. The entirety of question time will be taken up by this issue if we have long preambles into questions. I appreciate this is very sensitive and a very important issue, but it is important that questions are short, sharp and focused, and that answers are short, sharp and focused. Mr Alistair. When is the Minister going to start on this issue? being the minister for all communities, and not just the minister for the Sinn Féin community, despite her pious words. Well, I think, firstly, we are in a decade of centenaries, and I have not brought forward proposals for any of those issues. I know the NIO, obviously, through the auspices of the British Government, has given a commitment in terms of marking the centenary of the formation of this state. Um, as I say, I would have preferred a programme that looked at all of the centenary holistically. My focus in terms of being Minister for Communities is delivering vital services right across the community, be that in the areas such as Sandy Road, Donegal Pass, the market in which I live, Springfield Road or Shankill. It is issues around housing, it is issues around inequality, it is issues around income um, that people have, and that certainly where my focus has been over this last year, and particularly addressing issues relating to the pandemic. And that has been right across the community, because I see it as one community that may have different traditions. But my focus has been on delivering for all of those communities. And I think many in this chamber and outside would accept that I have done that in a respectful manner. Dr Steve Aiken. I thank the Minister very much indeed for her comments so far. And indeed, may I welcome the remarks made by the Deputy First Minister in regards to HRH Prince Philip, which is very much respected by our community and indeed by across of Northern Ireland. But in view of that and the spirit of reconciliation, could she and her party not see their way forward to agreeing to having just even a centenary stone here in, on the grounds of storming? Because I think that would say just as much. I think in terms of all of these issues, I mean, I've said it before, and you'll know yourself being a, a party leader, we all have a responsibility to look at the community as a whole. We are coming from a divided society, and we know that anything around symbols can cause tension. And I think the best way, the mature way, is to sit down collectively with all of the parties. I know my party is willing to do that. I know I'm willing to do that in terms of being a minister. Um, we need to sit down collectively on how we can address these issues so everyone feels that their issues and what is important to them are addressed in a collective manner. As I said, I have given a good example of how that was done in Belfast City Council, looking at the issue of Home Rule, looking at the issue of the Covenant, looking at the 1916 rising, then starting to look at this most recent period in terms of the centenaries uh, that we are approaching. That was done in a collective way with principles in terms of looking at all of the issues, and I think that that is the best way forward. It has been practised in Belfast. The sky did not fall in. Every party around that table, as I say, that is represented in this chamber um, has, has welcomed the approach that was taken. And I would say that if people are serious in terms of looking at the whole community, looking at the aspirations then of individual identities and needs, then sit down collectively around the table, sit down and work. I am willing to do that to look at all of these events, because the centenary is important for a good section of the community here, but so too is looking at the issue of partition and the ramifications that that had. And again, I accept people will have different perspectives around that, but let's sit down and see how we can mark all of these events collectively rather than trying to rip each other down, because what example is that sending out to the young people that were on the streets of Belfast and beyond over the last few weeks? 
We need to be seen to be providing leadership on these issues, and I would welcome that leadership has to come across this chamber and with all the executive parties, and I'll play my part in that. Shogden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I appreciate that the Minister and others do not wish to recognise the centenary, but is this not a lost opportunity to look forward for all in Northern Ireland by perhaps investing in youth? Um, and, and in doing so in the name of NI100. For me, uh, the centenary is about looking forward, and I think there's a real opportunity to do that. For all the issues that the Minister herself has raised, I think we have to look at how we unite Northern Ireland moving forward, and there is an opportunity through NI100. Well, firstly, I do recognise the centenary. I recognise that it's an historic event that happened, um, that it still has an impact on our society here today, where, what way you look at that society and what your hopes are forward. My view is, is that also partition happened, and it was a reality as well that also had an impact. And we need to look at all of these issues in the round in terms of how we address and organise programmes that can be bought into right across our communities and across society, and to do that in a coordinated and structured way. Because if it doesn't, then it becomes a free-for-all. It becomes then a fight and an argument. And I don't think that's good for the young people out there or for society as a whole. I have seen in good practice how this has worked, um, and I just think that we need to be looking at examples like that that have said and build on those in the time ahead. But that involves all parties um, around this assembly. Are they willing to buy into that? Are they willing to sign up the principles that looks at all of these events, that looks at it from the varying perspectives that, that, that are out there? I mean, I attend a Covenant events. I attended dinners to mark the Battle of the Somme and others. Um, some people chose not to do that at that time, and that's the type of responsible conversation and leadership that we need to have. I'm willing to engage in that, and the question is, is everybody else? Mr John O'Dowd. Thank you. I've set out an ambitious and long-term plan to increase the supply of social and affordable housing and reduce housing stress. However, these plans will take time to come to fruition. And whilst I share your concerns that there are a number of applicants for social housing and those in housing stress continues to grow, the projected outcome of my plan is about ensuring the supply of social homes and ensuring that it can meet the increase in demand. Crucial to this is the protection of social homes we have, ensuring that they can be maintained and ultimately through the housing executive in a revitalised form, being able to access borrowing to sustain um, itself and to build again. It is the new build programme that is short, in the shorter term is the key action that we can take, and one of my priorities is to enhance the investment and the increase in new social home starts. Once the budget for 2021-22 of the housing development programme has been finalised, I will announce further details on the new social homes that will be started very soon. I am aware that the housing executive um, that the current projected housing need for North Lurgan is for a further 168 new social homes between now and 2025, and the executive are committed to working with the housing association sector to bring forward new social home proposals to address that need. I understand the housing executive and social um, housing associations have been forwarding a high volume of proposals for the North Lurgan area over the past 12 months, and I am pleased to advise um, that new housing schemes providing 39 units are due to be complete in the area later this year. Mr O'Dowd. I thank the Minister for I welcome the Minister's plans uh, for social and affordable housing moving forward. Uh, and I thank the Minister for agreeing to meet me on housing issues in North Lurgan and rural areas within my constituency. Because the waiting list uh, continues to grow, will the minister undertake to keep the pressure up on the housing executive and social housing providers to ensure that housing is provided in areas of most need? I think yes, definitely. As part of the housing statement that was given last year, there are a number of strands of work in terms of looking at housing supply, in terms of looking at the social housing development programme, looking at issues of ring fencing in those areas of greatest need as well. So there are a number of areas um, that I will be bringing forward proposals in the short term, but indeed I have also given a commitment in terms of the overall revitalisation 
of our housing sector and ensuring that we are meeting those critical demands going forward, that I will present those plans to the executive that will be costed and timetabled before the end of this Assembly mandate. I call the Deputy Chair of the Communities Committee, Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you very much, and I absolutely support your commitment to social housing. But can I ask if you could assure this House that you're, you are committed to shared housing? We've recently seen disgraceful actions happening in Carrick Fergus. Um, can you assure this House that you will dedicate to providing shared housing where people from all cultures and backgrounds are able to live together, and that we stop enabling housing zones that exclude based on religion, culture or race? Yeah, I think recent reports in recent days are really unfortunate and obviously need to be condemned, and I, I know they have um, in terms of the community, because housing is a fundamental right. It's the basic thing that somebody needs and for society to function in terms of people having a home, and particularly those in most critical need. Um, so I am committed as part of the housing transformation. It is about building suitable, affordable and sustainable housing for those who need it um, and to build it where they need it as well. And of course, that will include um, a composition of shared housing uh, going forward as well. I mean, obviously, we are doing a number of programmes and we'll, we, we will be looking at that as part of the housing mix going forward. I'm more than happy sorry, to discuss it with the member um, as a follow up. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you give an update on the abolition of the rights to buy? A house scale scheme in the Housing Association since the passage of legislation last year, when action she is taking uh, to extend that to the NIHT properties. Thank you. Yeah, work is ongoing at the moment around bringing forward a consultation on the future of the Housing Executive House Sales Schemes, and this will be brought forward in the coming weeks. Mr. Robin Newton. I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, would you respond to the report uh, of yesterday in the Belfast Telegraph, which indicates that, uh, and as the current situation stands, that in 20 years' time we will not have met the housing need? Yeah, well, it's obviously the report is reflective of statements that have been made in this chamber, both by my predecessor, Carl, um, whilst I was off, and then subsequently me coming back. That's part of the critical reason that a statement was brought forward in November in terms of revitalisation of the housing executive, because one of the biggest issues is obviously to deal with the historic debt. I know we have um, gladly already dealt with the issue of corporation tax exemption, and that has obviously been really good. But we need to be getting the housing executive to build again. There are issues there in terms of supply, and we're bringing forward a housing supply strategy to look at these issues as well. Uh, we are also looking at the issue of homelessness and revising that as well. There has been some good learning as a result of COVID in terms of how we proactively work better with health, in terms of looking at issues of prevention, and also actually sustaining tenancies for people that they do not repetitively become homeless again. So all of those issues are part of the revitalisation agenda. Obviously, we are bringing forward some in terms of the house sales scheme. Because I recognise that on average we're building 1,800 homes a year. Nearly 500 of those are being sold off then in terms of the house sales scheme. So we need to fundamentally deal with that in terms of not depleting the social housing stock that we have there. And that's one of the areas that I'm looking at in the time ahead. Whilst being more ambitious with the housing development programme, 1,800 homes a year is not enough. And we need to have better ways of developing. Land is an issue, and obviously we're looking at the land and supply strategy as well. Minister, we're trying I'm to work with you're... local councils around that, but happy to share more info in terms of that uh, programme. Ms. Rachel Woods. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. And the Minister touched upon corporation tax in her answer to Mr Newton. On the 3rd of March, the Minister stated that the Housing Executive has paid almost £58 million in corporation tax, money that could have been invested in homes for the benefits of tenants. Can I ask then how change is made to corporation tax structures and financial savings stemming from it will be measured? And will savings be reallocated to address housing waiting lists, quality and added benefits for people? Yeah, well, part of the plan is we want that to go into maintaining the existing stock. There's obviously huge challenges, and again, that's part of the revitalisation agenda. That if we don't make changes now urgently, I mean, we've been talking about this for over a decade now, and change needs to happen now. 
or we're going to lose half of the stock that the housing executive has. That's the hard reality, and that's part of the cost and analysis that we're doing. So it is really good and significant, obviously, that the issue of corporation tax is now being resolved. Um, and obviously, we want that to go directly back in then um, in terms of that function around maintaining the properties that are there and then looking at new models going forward that the housing executive then can borrow in terms of having a more ambitious house building program as well. Mr. Declan McAleer. Kester uh, question number four. So I'm pleased to say that 887 uh, grant awards have been made for a total of £16 million. I know how important the charity sector has been in helping us through the crisis. My wish um, would have been for charities to claim all of the £20.5 million that was available, but I'm satisfied that the money claimed has met the urgent financial need and kept charities afloat. I'm grateful to our delivery partners, the National Lottery Community Fund and Community Finance Ireland, for the swift and agile way they administered the fund, and also to Nick for the, for the support that they've provided to the sector throughout this process. It would obviously not be possible to name all of the charities who were supported through the fund, but just to give an idea in terms of the diverse nature. So obviously we supported charities through chronic illness like Action Cancer, animal welfare and environmental charities like Kids Pony Foundation, religious groups such as Dundraw Presbyterian Church, homeless charities like Extern, community groups like Limavati Community Development Association, um, and many other charities um, that have relied on this essential funding to keep them going. Mr. McAleer. Well, I thank the Minister for her response and for her leadership in this issue. And indeed, that investment will come as a relief to a lot of charities whose, uh, whose traditional means of fundraising have been curtailed as a result of the pandemic. Will the Minister agree with me that charities play a huge role in our community? In our society, and they will need our ongoing support and assistance to rebuild as we move towards recovery phase. Thank you. Yeah, I think I mean charities play a huge role, um, and we can see that particularly during the height of the pandemic. I think obviously no one charity looks the same at the other, and you know there's large scale charities down to something that's very very local. So there's a wide range of activities um, that take place. Part of the engagement that we have had around COVID and around this fund has obviously allowed us to kind of establish and to look in more detail at the nature of the charity sector and obviously going forward as we look at the social recovery phase, the economic recovery phase, we want to continue to keep that engagement going to ensure that we do have a charity sector that is fit, um, that is able to deliver the services that they are and to make sure that any future shocks, whether they are economic or health, that we can then mitigate um, and learn the lessons from this most recent pandemic. Mr. Matthew Toole. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, Minister, it would just be helpful. Could you give us uh, an update on the total allocation to um, over, I think, the two um, the two tranches of funding to the, to, for the for the charities fund? Welcome, as it was. You said it was 16 million that was dispersed. Um, uh, 11.7, I think, was the second tranche that was announced in December by. Minister Nicolun, um, it would just be helpful if you could give us an update on exactly how much was allocated and how much was actually spent out of that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so phase one, uh, which opened last year, there were 501 successful applications, totalling £8.8 .8 million. Pounds. Phase two obviously opened in January of this year. There were 386 um, applications successful, of which a total fund of £7.18 million. Uh, was given as well, and obviously Community Finance Ireland's administration fees and that were attached in terms of the overall cost as well. So the total uh, fund and expend it was 16.3 million, and that includes the administration costs. Mr. Andy Allen, Speaker, and can I at the outset declare an interest as a charity trustee? Uh, the Minister and members across this House will be no doubt aware of the important and vital work carried out by charities right across Northern Ireland and further. Minister, can you advise what work the Department is currently undertaking to better understand the impact of COVID-19 on the charities moving forward, and, and what tailored programmes will be coming in the future to continue to support and sustain those charities? Well, obviously, firstly, the impact of COVID, I know we're starting to come out of restrictions and ease out of those, and hopefully there will be more announcements on Thursday. Um, and we'll be keeping a watch and brief in terms of the immediate issues that charities are facing. So obviously this funding was up until the end of the financial year. So we'll continue to keep that um, abreast and to look at that, just like other funds that have been administered. 
There's obviously been good learning, as I say. I mean, the pandemic has allowed the department to re-engage with charities in a way that maybe hasn't been done in a way, in terms of looking at the needs, in terms of looking at the impact of the charities, in terms of the learning of the pandemic as well, in terms of what it has exposed within our society and the vulnerabilities of certain sections and groups. Um, and I think as well in terms of the capacity and vulnerability of even the organisations themselves, that if there is a shock out there in society, how that impacts on their organisation. So there has been a lot of learning. Officials within the department are writing that up at the moment. And obviously we want to move forward um, to see what way we can support the charities, looking at the relationship that we've established with the lotteries, <laughs> um, with Community Finance Ireland and also with NICFA, who have done some really excellent work in supporting those charities as well, um, particularly around building resilience of volunteers that are involved looking at mental health programmes that have been run as well through the Warm Well and Connected programme. So we want to build on all of that in the time ahead and obviously have a co-design approach to any future provision that we make. That concludes uh, the time for table questions. Before we move on to topical questions, members, could I say I think it's a shame that we only managed to get to question number four on the order paper. I think it does a disservice to the other members who have tabled questions and it does a disservice to the public looking in that we were only able to discuss four issues in table questions today. So if I could appeal, and Lord above knows, you know, there's nobody more windy than me at times, but if I could appeal to members to please in future try to focus the questions so that we can get through more issues so that the people watching will get more answers to the issues. Fortunately for Mr Little, who was question five, He's the first person on the topical list, so he'll get to ask his question again I, if he wishes to. I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also wish the Northern Ireland women's football team uh, every success in the second leg of their Euro 22 playoff against Ukraine tonight for what would be a historic victory uh, and a major tournament qualification for the Green and White Army? And can I ask the Minister for an update on the sub regional football stadium fund? Yeah, no, thanks very much. I suppose, obviously, I mean, again, just to reiterate, the sub regional stadium is part of the new decade, new approach. Obviously, my officials undertook a robust, up to date, evidence based exercise and programme. There was a working group um, that was established involving local councils, IFA, Sport NI, etc., um, and the I, or sorry, NIFL as well. We're coming to the conclusion of that. Um, officials are collating all of that information. And by the end of this month, going into the start of next, I'm hopeful to bring forward recommendations on the way forward to executive colleagues. Mr. Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for an update on this long overdue funding for football. And can I ask the Minister what budget will be allocated to this much needed funding for facilities for football? It's still the same amount um, of funding uh, that was set aside, £36.2 million. Pounds. Um, and obviously, if there is a need or an overarching demand for more, then that would have to go to the executive for approval. But the budget as set out um, within the budget is the £36.2 million. Mr Keith Buchanan. And, uh, thank the Minister for answer so far. My question relates to uh, sports clubs with obviously bars and restaurants that got sort of left behind that weren't eligible for LRSS, CBRSS or indeed missed out on the Sports Sustainability Fund because they are waiting for clarification from LRSS. So I understand there's over 70 of those, Minister. Can you give us an update on what your plan is to support those, or they will not be sustainable? Well, I think when this issue arose, obviously the Sports Sustainability Fund had already opened, so I was not able at that point to pause that fund or to make changes um, or to allow any new applications in terms of when that closed for applications to be received. I know there has been some concerns, and obviously I've had some engagement. The Sports Sustainability Fund did allow that if they did operate a bar and they could show that those lost earnings have an impact in terms of their sport, they could apply under the Sports Sustainability Fund. Um, I did hold a meeting with the uh, Minister of Finance, obviously, to look at the issue as well, and I know officials were discussing it. Um, the difficulty is, obviously, the fund has closed. We have administered uh, the funding around that, and if clubs did not apply, I cannot change that in a sense. But obviously, we are considering to look at that to see if there are any new funding opportunities. Um, is there another round of sports funding that could be looked at? 
um, or could LRSS be amended, which I don't know if it could, because I know one of the concerns was that if it's on the rateable value, then a smaller sports organisation could be receiving more than a huge hotel, and there would be a disparity there then um, in terms of some of those issues. But again, we're keeping a watch and brief. I mean, I haven't been inundated with requests from sport organisations raising concerns directly. I just know from some of the dialogue, I mean, there's been issues and we've raised it. The difficulty was they didn't apply for the scheme. Um, and if they had it done so, they would have received the funding. But we are keeping a watch and brief, obviously, in terms of any other additional COVID monies that may be available uh, coming through them. We will uh, keep a watch and brief to see if we need to make a further bid um, to the executive via the finance minister in the time ahead coming into this financial year, alongside charities and, and other things that have been funded. Mr Buchanan. Thank you, and thank you, Minister Francis. So far, Minister, will you provide a commitment to me and to the House that you will open a new scheme and try and support those eight clubs? As one of my only Coke United Football Club, no doubt everybody else in their own areas will have numerous uh, clubs that need support. Will you provide commitment? You will open another scheme to support these because these clubs will not be here. I can give a commitment that I will engage and look at it. I mean, I can't give a commitment right now that I'm going to open a scheme without looking at an assessment, without realising if there's, there's no funding there in terms of my budget at the moment. Any funding would have to be coming through the COVID funding, which is then considered against health and educational and other priorities as well. But certainly all of these issues are being actively looked at, um, particularly as we're looking at the recovery period as well and making sure that uh, things can open. So we're, we're keeping a constant view of all of that, but more than happy to engage with you on this issue. Mr. Mark Durkin. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. We fully appreciate the efforts made and challenges faced by the Housing Executive to ensure everyone here has a roof over their head, particularly over this past year. However, there is a growing concern in my constituency and your, your party colleagues from my constituency will, will, will bear this out, not about the number of people being placed in temporary and emergency housing in Derry from other districts, but sadly the nature of some of those people. There have been a number of offences committed, including a sexual attack on a girl last week by people who have been placed in housing in Derry from elsewhere. Can the Minister explain the policy and practice that allows this to happen? Well, obviously, the issue of looking at accommodation, I mean, we do try and map out accommodation where it's needed. I mean, primarily it's a matter for the housing executive um, in terms of the accommodation strategy that they have. I know that that's being looked at currently. Obviously, COVID has presented a really big challenge um, in terms of people who have been made homeless uh, through no fault of their own over this last year. And obviously trying to keep with the public health advice, trying to get those people housed as quickly as possible in accommodation uh, where that's available. Unfortunately, sometimes that accommodation may not be available in the area that they are looking at or in the area that they need, um, and therefore they have to be placed in other areas. I mean, I know there has been issues pertaining to the dairy area. I know there's been communication with my department, and obviously we have engaged proactively with the housing executive to overcome those issues. We are looking at a homelessness strategy at the moment because we recognise that more needs to be done, that it's not meeting the need. We're also looking at a supply strategy in terms of uh, the accommodation that is on offer, and I will be hoping to bring forward proposals in the time ahead. So, more than happy um, to sit with the member if you wish, or to do a meeting um, with those representatives in your area um, to look at this issue in the time ahead, and obviously to engage the housing executive. Mr. Durkin. Thank the Minister uh, for that answer. Just want to, <laughs> in case anyone's in any doubt, I want to place on record that Derry is an extremely welcoming city. We've opened our arms, our hearts, and our doors to people from all over the world uh, seeking refuge and a better way of life. So I'm, I'm glad, and I just ask the Minister to, to confirm that she will commit to working with the Housing Executive, the PSNI, other agencies, and extremely importantly, communities to ensure improved management and minimise risk when it comes to the rehousing of known offenders. 
Yeah, just to concur, Derry is a lovely city. Um, it is very welcoming, and any time I've been there, I've been uh, welcomed by uh, the community across the board. I'm more than happy um, to meet and to sit uh, with the housing executive, with communities and others to discuss any of these issues. So if a request comes in, I'm more than happy to um, accept it. Ms Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, can I ask you how you intend to tackle regional inequalities in relation to the allocation of arts funding uh, that's distributed across the north? Thanks very much um, for your question. And obviously, this is an issue that obviously has been raised recently, uh, obviously by yourself and the previous member who has spoken. I know I've done a meeting, for example, with dairy artists and those in the northwest as well. And obviously, the issue of uh, regional disparity had come up. Um, the paper that they had presented, I mean, I would agree with most of what was in the paper that they put forward, and I know that's reflective of organisations in other parts of the North as well. I mean, obviously, we're going to be looking at a renewed culture and arts strategy going forward. For me, uh, the issue of equality around access and participation and how public funding is spent is going to be. Um, an important consideration as part of that strategy, and again, a commitment that I gave that we will do a co-design approach um, with organisations and with the sector and with the community on, a ground, on the ground in terms of the devisement of that strategy going forward. Mrs. Anderson. Uh, Minister, as you know, for me, it's always about standing up for dairy. So there's a lot of uh, goodwill. Uh, from all you said today about our constituency. And we do thank you as the members for a very positive meeting uh, with the arts sector. And there's fantastic community arts uh, organisations. I know you've met Studio 2 and um, the Nerve Centre, for instance, and many others, not to leave anyone out. So, Minister, can I ask you, given that Derry receives less than £21 per head of population, compared to Belfast in the allocation of arts funding. Will you tackle this by ensuring there will be a robust and dedicated strategy to, to tackle this stark inequality? I suppose just as I say it there, I mean I recognise the, the brilliant work that arts organisations, both at the grassroots and also strategically what they do um, in terms of building communities, in terms of the contribution that it makes to the economy, in terms of just giving an outlet and an offering for people to engage in arts activities and programmes. Um, and I suppose as part of the review and the strategy going forward, it is my commitment that the equality issue around access and participation in terms of public funding will be one of the key important considerations of that strategy. Now, if we could call up Mr. Colm Gildernew on the screen. Mr. Colm Gildernew. And thank you, Minister, for your answers to date. Minister, um, can you provide us with an update on the new Riverine, or Riverine Community Project in Strabane and Lifford? Yeah, well, just um, it was obviously announced recently, just in the last couple of weeks, obviously that the funding of 8.9 million euros um, was granted. Obviously, my department played a role in terms of the funding towards that. And obviously, this project is a cross-border community park, which links the Straban and Lifford areas together in cultural trails and looking at the history in terms of looking at peace and reconciliation um, as well, and also just physically connecting the communities that live there and allowing them the opportunity then for open green space. So obviously, it's an excellent project. Um, I know I've engaged. Uh, obviously through press and through a video um, for the amazing work. I mean, this has been over a decade in the making um, in terms of this project, and I gave a commitment that once the regulations allow me to do so, that I want to go down and visit the project just to see it uh, myself as well. So I look forward to that. Mr Gilder, you for a supplementary. Cormac, Minister, and I thank the Minister for, for your commitment to this project and the significant investment your department is making. Um, would you agree with me? I went to school in Caledon, the border village, um, and we were effectively cut off throughout that entire time from Glasslock, just a, a mile or two on the other side of the border. Uh, to, to, with the result that I would know very few people actually from that community, even though we're side by side here. So would, would you agree with me the project like this are crucial because the border has artificially stunted the potential of those communities which straddle it? 
Yeah, I think 100%. I mean, we know how many people cross the border um, every day, and for them it's seamless in terms of living on one side, working on the other, or vice versa, or obviously going for medical treatment um, or for education. And obviously, the more that we can build connections between communities, both physically and also through programmes, um, to promote cohesive communities, to promote reconciliation and peace building, but also vitally to deliver services, essential services that people need, be that education, health, or other, um, then I think that that's a good thing. And whether that's in the border constituencies or whether that's in our city communities that feel disconnected from city or town centres. Restitching and reconnecting those communities back in together um, is a critical area, and it's something in terms of regeneration and indeed through the peace programme that I want to look at more. Ms. Rachel Woods. Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware of the impact of any budget cuts for the independent advice sector would have on people who are vulnerable in poverty or who have mental health issues. So can I ask the Minister if any impact assessment has been conducted by our department on the number of appeals currently awaiting hearing? Obviously, in terms of the advice sector, uh, there are no cuts. I mean, I've already made clear that that budget um, will be protected in the incoming financial year. And obviously, pertaining to that budget, there was a full equality impact assessment that was carried out by my department. In terms of looking at the issues of appeal times, I mean, obviously, a part of the reason for that is the pandemic. Business had to stop essentially overnight um, in terms of that, and that has obviously had an adverse impact on those looking at that. We're obviously working with the department and also the appeal service to look at what we can do. Um, in terms of the impact that this has on people. I know there has been assessments done um, to look at the time scales, to look at the impacts. Obviously, we're trying to develop a programme that looks at that again. It's going to be working with the appeal service because I know with the announcement just after Christmas in terms of the regulations, the appeal service suspended all appeals until the start of April. So again, and you know, that's their right to do that. I can't have a say over that. So we're engaging proactively with the appeals service, who I know want to reduce the number of appeals as soon as possible, and obviously we'll bring that forward um, in the time ahead. We've already started listing and giving the opportunity for telephone appeals, online appeals as well, um, but we know still that the majority of people like face-to-face -face contact, and obviously with restrictions in place, you know that limits what we can do. But obviously we are looking at a programme to try and bring down that waiting list as quickly um, as possible and when it's safe to do so. Ten second supplementary, ten second answer. I thank the Minister for her answer. In relation to funding for tribunal representation, um, could the Minister outline how much funding has been allocated and ring fenced in this year's budget? I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but the budget will be the same as what it was um, in the previous financial year. Obviously, we're still uh, agreeing and I'm signing off the final budget. Um, but there will be no change from what there was previously. Thank you, uh, members. That concludes questions to the Minister for Communities. If members could take their ease for a few moments, we will then move on to questions to the Economy Minister. Thank you.